All right, let's turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 19. A message entitled, uh, The Riot Caused by Local Union 666. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, that'll be kind of self-explanatory as we uh, get into the text. But uh, the things to keep in mind, because we were, uh, you know, in Ephesus last week, is that God, you know, is a very appropriate song, The Revivus, because this is a church that uh, has come into existence, in a sense, in the midst of revival, that continued. We talked about the fact that uh, in this church in Ephesus really is the, the, is the epicenter uh, of the occult in the world at that time. And Athens was known for its intellectualism, its philosophy. Paul's been there. Corinth is known for its, its uh, sensuality, its sexuality, and so forth. If you called somebody a Corinthian in the first century, that was definitely a, a derogatory term. It meant they had no morals at all. Uh, but... Um, Ephesus is the epicenter for the occult. And we saw it as saved people, church members, began to be convicted of the fact that they still had books and scrolls and so forth that dealt with the occult, with the magic arts and so forth. And they were continually, we talked about the present tense, they were continually bringing these things, obviously in a very public place, and then, uh, and then burning them and doing it for a very good reason. God was convicting them of their sin, and they were seeing it, repenting from their sin, and they were doing it in a very public way. Now, we emphasize uh, the, the value of what they did, uh, that these scrolls, uh, today's economy, would be worth about $5 million. Uh, so this was a, a very big thing, uh, and, uh, and we talked about what God was doing in their own hearts, uh, but just to help us understand really what was going on here spiritually as well. Uh, these people are, this is the real deal. Satan was really alive and well in this city. These people really were under a, an incredible bondage and under his, uh, under his power. We had uh, some folks visiting with us for a, a couple of weeks who were from uh, Calvary Chapel in Colorado Springs that we've uh, had the pleasure of, uh, of uh, being there uh, at a couple of years ago. Uh, and... Um, uh, one of the gals was telling me about the, the, their daughter that from that Calvary went on an outreach to Uganda. And uh, one of the things that uh, the missionaries down there were praying for is this team came from Colorado Springs, you know, that God would work and people would get saved. But some, God would do something powerful in one particular village in particular that would help, in a sense, capture the hearts and the minds and the attention of the people that were there. And it happened. The local witch doctor got saved and came to faith in Christ in this little village. So what he did then that night, as they were around the fire, he brought out his, well, his books and his scrolls and all the stuff that had to do with the occult and casting spells and so forth, and he publicly threw those in the fire. Nobody told him about this chapter. He never read that chapter. He just knew that that's what he needed to do. And as he did, an image came up out of the fire representing this man that appeared before everybody and then dispersed into the heavens. And they took a picture of it. Uh, this is the real deal. People are really under a real spiritual power. And, uh, uh, and that's got to be broken uh, for God to be able to impact the community. We talked about this church uh, is different than all the other churches that Paul visits. He spent. there in Greece, in northern and southern Greece, and get it, uh, as we'll see in our text, all the way to Rome, which is desire. He's got he's to break the back of the enemy at the epicenter. There's a lot of people that would say, Paul, you're crazy for going to that city. He says, no, that's where the devil is. People are under his power. That's where I want to go. There are other men like that. Hudson Taylor was a man like that. When he went to China, somebody told him, wherever you go, Mr. Taylor, don't go to this city. It was kind of the Las Vegas of China at the time. Lots of prostitution, drunkenness, gambling, and so forth. Hudson Taylor said, how do I get there? <laughs> that's a place where people need Jesus Christ. And he went on to that city. Uh, that's like the Apostle Paul here. So good to have that all, all kept in mind. We're going to talk about the, the temple uh, to Artemis or Diana. And, and uh, we mentioned the fact that it's over, uh, it took 200 years to build. Uh, it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, they're going to make reference to it uh, in, our, in our text. Uh, it was uh, a football field and a half in length. And um, 
and uh, you know, 50, 60 feet in height, uh, uh, just an incredible building. When, uh, when King Xerxes of the Persian Empire that we read about in Esther, when he basically invaded Greece, attempting to take it, he saw the temple and said, that's how far back it went, we're in the first century now. He said, don't destroy that, don't harm it. It's, it was such a, an incredible piece of, uh, of architecture. The other thing you need to know historically, and I mentioned it briefly, is that, and we'll see it again in the text, they will make reference to the image of Artemis or Diana that Zeus brought down from heaven. In reality, historians tell us that it was probably a meteorite that fell, uh, a piece of black rock, and then craftsmen carved it into what we would might consider to be a grotesque image, but with a symbol of fertility and sexuality and so forth, a large image that was, uh, again, centered in that particular uh, temple. Let me show you just a couple more slides that we looked at last week. So here's uh, the amphitheater that will be the kind of the basis for uh, Luke's narrative here. And uh, right now today would seat about 25,000 people. Uh, but there are archeologists and some other historians that believe that because it's not fully excavated, it may have held as many as 50,000 in Paul's day. And again, like most Roman amphitheaters, uh, perfect acoustics where that per person is at the base uh, they could speak, uh, and it could be heard very clearly, uh, even to the upper rows. And then we've got one more slide just for a comparison to show you how it looked at in the first century. And then at the bottom, the comparison with the sides of uh, Wrigley Field. So, uh, you know, close to, to, the, uh, uh, to the size of a, a possibly Aloha Stadium, as we uh, think about that today. Where UH happened to win last night. I just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> Three points wasn't a lot, but... Thankful for all the wins we can get. <coughs> but anyway, so that's the background uh, on, our, on our story, this church and what God is doing there. And certainly now there's uh, opposition. Let's look at verse 23 and 27. One man speaks against the church and was saying in a very dishonest way. You'll see why in a moment. Uh, when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent to Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. So a couple little verses, introductory comments that kind of bridge the last narrative we were into, the one we're coming to uh, here with this man, uh, Demetrius. So Paul is basically going to send Timothy uh, and Erastus on back to Macedonia, back to Corinth, back over to, uh, to Greece. He's going to remain for a time. It ends up being a very extended period of time. Mentions his desire to eventually get back to Jerusalem. Uh, and of course, very importantly, his first mention of Rome. This is the first time he mentions, won't be the only time, but uh, as he writes to the church at Rome, begins in chapter 1 of how, I long to come and be with you. In chapter uh, 15, he mentions the fact that I have been hindered from coming to you, but it's in his heart. Paul's very strategic. Uh, in what he does in terms of trying to get the gospel to the world in, uh, in his lifetime in terms of reaching major Roman cities uh, and from there churches can be planted and the people in that, those churches could then continue with the Great Commission and go out. But uh, it's of uh, uh, noting uh, first reference to his desire to go to Rome. Let's go on to verse 23. And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way and again, that's based on John 14, 6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So again, the way was a sect of Judaism that included the believers, Jews, and now Gentiles that believed Jesus was the Messiah. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together, and the workers in similar occupation and said, men, you know that our prosperity you know we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see in here that uh, not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned many people, uh, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. Uh, so not only in this trade of ours in danger of falling in disrespute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed whom all Asia and the world worship. So we're saying it's a, it's a disingenuous uh, or a dishonest uh, argument because his real motivation is money. It's all based on a concern for a loss of, uh, of income. 
Uh, notice again, verse 24, it's Demetrius. He's a silversmith. He's making shrines. So he's making the little shrines out of silver. They're selling them and so forth. Uh, and so they're losing money. Uh, they lost income because of the changed lives of, of Christians. Paul didn't go out speaking in opposition to the silversmiths. He didn't picket the Temple of Diana, uh, and he didn't stage an anti-idolatry uh, uh, rally. He just preached the truth uh, of the gospel. It was just the natural results of, uh, of people coming to faith in Christ. We see a similar incident in Matthew 8 when uh, Jesus cast the demons out of the man of Gadara, uh, and as a result, they lost one of their industries as well which was, uh, again, uh, herding pigs and so forth. Very difficult to explain uh, uh, being in Israel, that you would have a business uh, raising pigs. Uh, and so they are destroyed. Uh, and, and they're upset with Jesus. And they want him to leave because of a loss of income. And it's uh, been that way throughout church history as well. Uh, you can go back and read newspaper clippings and articles of Dwight M M uh, Moody, uh, Billy Sunday, uh, and back in those days, when, a, uh, when something good happened in terms of Christianity, it was front page news. It would be the front page story that Dwight, Dwight L. Moody had uh, uh, brought a revival. And they, then in the article, they list how many people were, were saved, how many people had made recommitments to the Lord, how many people had uh, attended the, the crusade each night. And then they would always list the number of businesses that had closed. That would be bars. <laughs> no business. Can't stay in business any longer because nobody is frequently uh, frequently those places because of their faith uh, in Jesus Christ, because of the changed life. Uh, and in fact, with the Salvation Army uh, in Great Britain and in places like London in particular, uh, they had an entire group come against them. So many people who were coming to faith in Christ because of the Salvation Army Another group was formed called the Skeleton Army. And they were made up of all the people that owned brothels and uh, in bars. Uh, and they pledged pretty large sums of money uh, to set up rallies against the Salvation Army in opposition. Exactly, in a sense, what's, uh, what's happening here. So what's happened in terms of this text has happened in church history. Now, the curious thing is that there's tremendous opposition in our country and our culture to Christianity today. I mean, unlike any, any, other, any other time. There's not a week goes by, there's not a story uh, about uh, somebody who is a Christian who is either being fined by the federal government, their business is being shut down by the federal government, uh, or some other story, some other story of discrimination, whether it's in the military now or, or in the public sector. I, I don't think it's because we're having such an impact on the world and on our culture. I don't think it's because there's so many thousands of people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. I think it's just because we're living in the last days. I think it's just the times that uh, we're living in. Uh, but we certainly live in, uh, in days of men like, uh, like Demetrius, uh, and that's for sure. Secondly, uh, one speaker uses arguments, as I mentioned, that are uh, deceptive. Uh, notice what he does. He gets the, the people's attention there. Obviously, he's worried about his own pocketbook and how much money he's not making uh, that he had made previously. Uh, he makes an appeal to them in pride. Hey, it's not about that. It's about the honor of the city. It's about the greatness of our goddess and her temple. We see that in verse 20, 27. Also, the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised. Oh, man, we wouldn't want that to happen. Her magnificence, uh, magnificence destroyed. Hey, it's all Asia and the world that, uh, that worship her. And we know from first century archaeology, from documents, that, that uh, certainly the world at that time was polytheistic. They weren't really into it. You know, that's, that's a tough sell. I mean, from an intellectual standpoint, you know, the whole Greek mythology thing, that's a guy named Zeus, kind of threw this thing down here. You know, it's just, it's, what would be the evidence for that? We don't know. We're just going with it. You know, there, it's, you know I, I've read some like third century apologetics, Christianity, guys uh, uh, that basically are making an appeal to the world at that time to turn away from polytheism and to uh, faith in Christ. Uh, and it's, uh, it's pretty fun reading because uh, uh, that's, that's, not a, that's not a tough argument to make that, uh, that uh, the gods are out there and these sticks and stones. Notice what he says. He's actually saying that you can't make a god with your own hands. Imagine that, you know. 
Uh, the people in the first century had a tendency to just kind of go with the flow with all of this. This guy is not really concerned about the honor of Diana in their temple. He's really concerned about his own pocketbook. And we would say that there are many Demetrius kinds of arguments in our own culture today. One of them would be the, the argument of abortion. Why should we have legalized abortion in this country? Well, we all know it. So a woman will have the right to choose. Is, is that really a good argument? Is that really a, a logical argument? Does that argument really hold up? Well, we're not going to let you have the reasoned argument. We're just going to start shouting like, like a bunch of crazy people like they do in this amphitheater. Uh, think about it. Uh, much of the argument is, is uh, based on the fact that there's about a half a billion dollars a year that are made through abortion. That's really it. That's really the bottom line to uh, those that make this argument. Alan Guttenmacher in his uh, uh, research discovered from Planned Parenthood that it's only 7% of abortions that are considered hard cases. 3% involve the mother's health, 3% involve the, uh, a health problem with the baby, 1% rape or incense. So 93% of all abortions in this country are for social reasons. Uh, we don't really want to talk about those reasons. That would be things like, it would change my life. I'm not ready for responsibility. I can't afford a child. I'm in a bad relationship. Uh, I have enough children already. Well, those are awesome arguments for taking the, uh, the life of your child. But uh, we can't have those. We have to do with these other things. Demetrius type arguments because of a half a billion dollar a year industry that's, uh, that's behind it because after all, a woman has a right to choose. But then again, does she? Actually, research shows, shows that that's part of the problem. Women have abortions because they don't have a right to choose. In an article entitled, Who's Making the Choice? In a post-abortion uh, review states that hundreds of thousands of women undergo unwanted abortions every year to please someone else or because of pressure or coercion by their sexual partners, parents, social workers, counselors, employers or school administrators. A boyfriend or parent threatens to throw her in the streets unless she follows his or her wishes. A boss gives an employment ultimatum. Social or school stigma interferes with the choice the girl would otherwise make. According to the survey of 252 post-abortive women, more than half said they felt forced into an abortion by others. For, that doesn't sound like a choice, does it? It sounds like they're being forced into an abortion. One survey, 70% of women choosing an abortion so-called say they believe abortion is immoral, 70%. They violate their own conscience. It's not because of choice. It's because of pressure, and they're being pressured into it. Uh, more than 80% of women who report post-abortion problems say that they would have carried the child to full term if they only had some kind of help and support from family or friends that would allow them to do that. There's not a lot of choice in women having an abortion. That's a Demetrius kind of a argument. Can a woman choose with her own body to steal, to do illegal <coughs> drugs, to be a prostitute? No, no, they, they certainly can't. There's lots of things a woman can't do with her own body. Again, uh, this, lodge, this reason uh, for abortion that everything is predicated on is a Demetrius kind of argument. It's disingenuous, it's a disingenuous to women themselves, uh, and it's all driven by a half a billion dollar a year uh, industry. So here in Ephesus, one man speaks against the church, and it's quite uh, dishonest, uh, and we live in those kinds of times today as well. Secondly, the crowd shouts against the church in ignorance. There's a little shouting going on today as well, verse 28. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the, rushed into the theater in one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul travel, uh, Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing, some another, for the assembly was confused. Most, most of them did not know what they had come together, why they had come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander motioned with one hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. 
But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, great as Diana of the Ephesians. You can imagine, you know, 30, uh, you know, 50,000 people. Not really sure why they're there, but they're, they're one voice, man. We're just crying out for two hours, great as, great as uh, Diana. Well, that's, uh, that's a, a reasonable and a logical reason to, uh, to shout against the church and, and the gospel, but that's what's going on. It's because the church here is, is growing and it's prevailing. Leaders are being raised up. Discipleship is ongoing. And I think, again, very importantly, we've seen this very public demonstration of people's faith, public demonstration of people re repenting from their sins. They've taken a public stand for Christ, and it's been at a tremendous expense. Uh, and that testimony has become powerful in this strategic city. Secondly, the crowd shouting, as I mentioned, yet they, they don't really know what they're doing. Verse 32, some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. Most of them did not know why they had come together. Benjamin Franklin said a mob was a monster with heads enough but no brains. And uh, that's what we have going on here. Uh, and that's true of, uh, uh, of, uh, of a lot of mobs and a lot of riots uh, and, a lot of, and a lot of crowds. We just, we just had, we have had riots in the streets of a city in our country just a few weeks ago. It was on the news uh, uh, every, every night. Uh, many, I'm sure, weren't exactly why they were there, but they were just there uh, and uh, uh, unfortunate. Uh, one, uh, one early historian, uh, Tadius, who was an eyewitness of the festivals that took place here, and this was the, the setting. Uh, there was a lot of people in the city because of an annual uh, a feast that was held in honor of the temple and of Artemis or Diana. Uh, and he wrote this, uh, quote, it was the festival of Artemis and every place was full of drunken men and all the marketplace was full of a multitude of men through the whole night. So again, the ritual chant, great is Artemis uh, of the Ephesians, uh, yeah, again, uh, is uh, echoed throughout the entire city. One writer said it was a religious mob that shouted, crucify him, crucify him to Pilate, and eventually got his way. Had this Ephesian mob succeeded in its plans, Paul would have been arrested and executed before the law could have stepped in to protect him. That's really what they want. There's a sense that if they can kill Paul, uh, they can end this thing called the way or Christianity. Thirdly, about this crowd shouting, is that despite that Paul wants to go into the amphitheater, we see that in verse 30, and two groups of people are trying to stop him. And when Paul wanted to go to the people, the disciples would not allow him. So you have the disciples, his traveling companions. Uh, then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the, uh, into the theater. In terms of why Paul wants to go in uh, and so forth, uh, let's say, let's think about it. You've got an uh, amphitheater with perfect acoustics and 50,000 unbelievers in there. I wonder why Paul wants to go in. I would say it's to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because that's what he does every time he gets the opportunity, every trial that he, uh, he's in, every time he's before, uh, whether it's a Roman emperor uh, or somebody else, a pro council, he uses it to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, never to uh, defend uh, himself, which is a good reminder of us to pray for, uh, again, a Calvary Chapel pastor that's imprisoned in Iran, uh, again, Pastor Saeed Abini, who uh, basically is languishing away uh, there after a couple of years uh, in, in prison. Uh, but, uh, but his wife, who because of that, has had the opportunity to speak not only uh, before members of Congress, uh, before the United Nations, not only in New York, but also in Geneva uh, and lots of other places and be interviewed and so forth. Uh, and she uses those occasions and those speaking opportunities for one reason, one reason only. I was talking to Jack Abelin last summer and, and they know her and she had just spoken at the church and, uh, and they spent some time with her and she said, you know, uh, I may never see my husband again this side of heaven. I don't know if my speaking or, uh, and uh, visibility will help him get out or not. That, that is no longer the motivation. The only motivation is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I may never see my husband again, but God's given us a platform greater than we could have ever imagined in terms of the church planning, the orphanages, and the things that have been doing over the years. That's what Paul's doing here. Yes, Christians still still do that, uh, and we live in those days. And I'd encourage you to 
uh, keep him in your prayers. Paul wanted to appear. There's two groups of people that prevent him. One is uh, his traveling companions. They're referenced as the disciples. The other group is very interesting, even officials of Asia. It's a particular Greek word. It's not just uh, any officials. These are Roman officials that are in charge of the annual feast by which all Roman citizens would have to come, bow their knee, burn the incense, and say, Caesar is Lord. That's what these guys are in charge of. That was their Roman duty and responsibility. The fact that these guys are now friends of Paul, I would say they must have got saved. <laughs> to hold that position and be a friend of Paul, that's kind of a contradiction. Something's happened in the lives of these guys, and they don't want Paul to go uh, in there. Uh, they know what would happen to his life. And so, very interesting. Again, uh, in Ephesus, uh, the kinds of people that are coming to faith in Christ. You've got people that are deeply uh, uh, rooted in the occult, obviously. Uh, you've got Roman officials uh, and, uh, and many others. Uh, they literally have uh, impacted this community uh, in a tremendous way, which makes it certainly worth our while to, uh, to study what transpired there. Uh, the crowd is shouting. We have another individual introduced, Alexander. Uh, we're saying he'll try to take advantage of it. Now, he obviously, uh, two things are obvious in verse 33 and 34. Uh, the folks there are very anti-Semitic. Uh, notice, uh, and they drew Alexander out of the multitude. Uh, he's Jewish. The Jews putting him forward. We'll talk about the motivation for that. And Alexander motioned with one hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out he was a Jew with all one voice, they cried out for about two hours, great as Diana of the Ephesians. So we, we do know a little background on this particular individual. And, and remember that Paul began his ministry like he does in other cities in the synagogue. Reasoning, and we said that word is uh, the word for arguing. He's giving arguments and he's argumentative uh, in the way he is uh, presenting the gospel to them, which uh, for a Jewish crowd is uh, perfectly culturally acceptable. Uh, and, uh, and Paul is doing that, and he does it as long as he can for several weeks until they'll finally kick him out. The people that kick him out are guys like this. Uh, there are those that have received the gospel, those that have rejected it. So then he goes into the lecture hall of Tyrannius, and he uh, continues on uh, midday preaching and making disciples there. Uh, but the Jews at that point, uh, they do not want this turmoil to be reflected against them. Uh, they want to make sure that, uh, hey, we're with you guys, uh, and we, also, we want to see this guy ended. So fine with us if you kill the apostle Paul, because we got a, we got a problem with him as well. So that's his motivation. He, you know, he's pushed forward by the Jews. Hey, get up there and let them know that we're on their side in this whole deal. Uh, we don't want them storming the synagogue next week and come, coming after us. Uh, they would be defending themselves in a sense, and they also want to see the Apostle Paul uh, in his life uh, ended or at least uh, driven out of town. Now, he, he caused such a commotion for the Apostle Paul that at the end of his life, when Paul is in the Mamertine prison in Rome and the dungeon that is still there today, and, uh, he, he knows rightly so, that his life will end uh, very soon. He writes one more letter to his beloved son uh, in the faith, Timothy, and he says to him uh, at the end of the letter in 2 Timothy 4.14, Alexander the coppersmith, again writing to Ephesus, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must be aware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. Uh, this guy is uh, a thorn in the side of the Apostle Paul and the gospel uh, itself. Uh, uh, words of a dying man uh, to his son of the faith. Watch out for this guy. He caused me a lot of harm. Uh, and I know that he's still there uh, in Ephesus. So we're said so far that one man speaks against the church very dishonestly. The motivation was money. He tries to appeal to the pride of the people. It gives a very disingenuous argument. And certainly we said there, I just mentioned one, abortion. There's, there are a lot. So we could talk about intelligent design versus the evolution. Uh, that gets shouted down. Nobody wants to talk about actual fact, actual scientific fact. There's no discussion that can be held. If you're the professor that brings it up, we're going to try to get you out and shout you out of our university as soon as we can. Uh, you know, these, these Demetrius-type arguments 
uh, surround us today uh, in the church. That led to the crowd's uh, shouts against the church uh, in, uh, in ignorance. And um, uh, some of the most recent shouting uh, just happened a few days ago, that at least that I read about it. Uh, and that was of uh, a little industrial town north of Boston. Uh, and there, uh, uh, Gordon College, which is a very fine uh, Christian evangelical institution uh, there in Boston, been there a number of years, would send over into this city almost 20% of the people below the poverty line. Uh, they're a teaching school. They would send teachers uh, to teach these kids in after school programs and mentoring and tutoring. And they've been doing it for 11 years. It's been a, a huge blessing. They would uh, then bring hundreds of these kids uh, annually on the campus to introduce them to the idea of college. And you can do this and you can get an education and so forth. Uh, and up until now has been uh, uh, very well received. But uh, just this last week, uh, they were informed that that program of 11 years would have to end. And the reason it would have to end uh, is, uh, is because of a piece of legislation. Well, it's not a piece of legislation. It failed as a piece of legislation. But now uh, our president, President Obama, has said he's going to sign an edict to put in place what's called EDNA, or the Employment, uh, Employment Non-Discrimination Act. And basically what it says is if you have 15 employees or more uh, and you, for some reason, refuse to hire somebody that's a homosexual, then the weight of the federal government in terms of a discrimination suit against you uh, will be uh, brought to full, full bear on your particular business. There is a religious exemption for churches only, but not other Christian businesses, such as a Christian college. So under this, again, it, w it didn't pass. It w didn't make it through Congress. So the president is just going to sign it in uh, as uh, another of his edicts. Uh, and, uh, and again, a Breakpoint article that I read concerning this says the following. Uh, Lindsay, who is the uh, president of Gordon College, Lindsay and Gordon College are simply requesting uh, that the president provide the same religious exemption that was passed by a U.S. Senate bill last year with bipartisan support. By requesting that Edna not discriminate against them, Gordon is now receiving the end of a new witch hunt. Uh, the leaders of Lynn, this little uh, town, in their wisdom, have ended the volunteer program with the kids, saying, in effect, we can't let those bigots near our school children. As Ron Dreher, writing the American Conservative, says, one school official has said that, quote, Gordon needs to say, the college, I'm sorry for the request in the letter, and I'm sorry for being true to their Christian faith and their heritage. What was his big sin? He wrote a letter to the president. Could we be exempted from this, this uh, Edna, from this uh, uh, discrimination bill? That's all he did, but that was a sin. So you can't speak out against any of these issues. You can't say that you should have a religious exemption. That's where we're at today. It's just a shouting match. Nobody can talk about the actual, what's transpiring. Who's losing? The kids. The kids are losing. Is this an isolated incident? No, it's repeated across our country. People are hurting in major cities because groups like Catholic Charities have basically been booted out because they would not agree with the homosexual agenda. Uh, it's very interesting the days that, uh, that we're living in. We hear our own president and, uh, and former Secretary of State Clinton, uh, if you'll listen for, listen for a couple of terms, they'll use terms like the freedom of worship. What do they mean by that? That means you can go in your building and you can worship, but don't bring it out here. They believe in the freedom of worship. That is in contrast to what our founding fathers fought and died for, and that is the freedom of religion. That means I can walk into the public square, in my public office, in my building, in my business, and I can take a stand and express my religious views. Freedom of religion. I can't be discriminated against by others or by the government because of my religious views. That's what's in danger, our First Amendment rights. There's a lot of shouting going on out there. Nobody knows exactly what they're saying. And there's a lot of confusion, uh, and uh, it's just like the scene in this amphitheater here in Ephesus in the first century. Well, there's one man that attempts to save the day, the unlikely hero. Uh, I've kind of subtitled this, or is he really saving himself? Verse 35. And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know 
that the city of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are pro councils. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being called into question today for today's uproar, there being no reason which we may give account for this disorderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So the city clerk who attempts to save himself by quieting the crowd. So he's not, uh, he's a Roman official. Uh, he's a city official, excuse me. He's a city official in a free city. Uh, the Romans would love to come in at Ephesus and go, I think we'll just take this over again. But they've allowed them to rule themselves. They're in a, they're in a free, free city. Uh, he is not the proconsul, but he's the one who delivers uh, all of the official messages uh, from, uh, from Rome. Uh, anything the city has to say and so forth, this is, this is his gig in the, in the amphitheater. This guy walks on the stage in this amphitheater. Everybody in the amphitheater knows that's the guy. He's got something pretty important to say. We better shut up and listen here. That's just kind of how it worked. That was his position. He was the one guy that walked, could walk on that stage and everybody go, oh, okay. Yeah, there's something, about, uh, something very important about ready to be set. That's, that's why he's able to go and everybody's quiet. It's because of his position. Uh, and, uh, and so, again, he also appeals to their pride. Um, who doesn't know that the, city, uh, that the city of Ephesus is the temple guardian of the greatest, uh, 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 great goddess Diana? Again, uh, he, he says that. He appeals to their pride. He appeals to their belief system. Uh, he makes reference uh, uh, to the image coming down. He kind of retells the story. He retells their own little gospel story about Zeus. Uh, sending this little goddess, uh, you know, down, and then uh, that's how this whole temple was uh, was built, and so forth. Why does he need to do that? Because their entire belief system is crumbling around them because of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because what Paul is able to do is make a reasonable defense of why there is one God and why we need to believe in it. Writing again to the church uh, in Rome, uh, longing to get there at some point in time. He's able to talk about those two, those two witnesses that everybody has. Everybody's got a conscience, uh, and everybody can see creation. Uh, and Paul is able to make a reasonable defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And their belief system needs some defending. He appeals to the pride. He appeals to their belief system. In terms of why he intervened, uh, well, it's because of a concern about Roman law. And that's in verse 40. Uh, there's a very important statement if you're an underliner there. For we are in danger of being called into question for today's uproar. Uh, therefore, being, uh, there being no reason which we, we may give uh, to account for this, quote, there's an important phrase, disorderly gathering, otherwise known as a riot. Why? Because under Roman law, even in a free city, it was a capital offense to cause a riot capital offense like and somebody's going to die kind of capital offense so uh, the heads of this city maybe this guy in particular probably demetrius and, and some others if they don't quiet this thing down if this thing gets reported back to the romans they're going to come in here and literally some heads are going to roll and uh and that's not a figure of speech uh, and they are going to take this city back over again and so everybody in the crowd went oh yeah and then they left I just threw in the, oh, yeah, but it says they quieted down. Uh, they realized what he was saying, uh, and basically they, uh, they lived. Notice verse 37. Uh, you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. And again, the punchline is the idea of the disorderly gathering. So again, Luke is, uh, uh, in terms of the big picture again of, of the book, this is another one of those incidents where where Luke will feature in the narrative Paul, in a sense, being brought on trial. And guess what? He is innocent. And that's going to happen. We're going to see that more and more. We're going to see him before Agrippa, for Festus, uh, and eventually uh, uh, he goes all the way to Rome uh, before Nero. Because Luke is making the, ki the case that Christians should not be persecuted by the Roman government. 
We are the way. We are a part of Judaism. Judaism is legal under the Roman Empire. We should not be persecuted. It's one of the reasons he's writing, uh, and we see that uh, here once again, uh, that uh, nothing happens uh, because the Christians, and Paul in this case, are, uh, are innocent. So one man speaks against the church very dishonestly. Uh, we certainly have that going on. The same motivation is money. The shouts against the church are in ignorance, uh, and certainly that uh, uh, is almost becoming uh, a daily occurrence, at least on a national scene uh, in our culture. Uh, one man saves the day, and he's a city clerk. Uh, let's pray we don't have to rely on a city official to save the church of <laughs> Jesus Christ, because that's a mistake. That, that is a mistake. Uh, we need to be involved. We need to do what we can do. Uh, but that's not where we want to place our, our faith uh, and our hope. We would say, though, there was one other man that stood against the powers of darkness, and we might entitle just a couple things, lessons from Ephesus. One is the Apostle Paul. He's the guy that stood against the powers of darkness. There would have been a lot of people, again, to say, Paul, you want to go where? Ephesus, not there. You don't want to go there. And he goes, no, that's exactly where I need to go. And it may be where I'll go and stay the longest, because we need to do what Jesus said to do, which I believe is what's happening over in Matthew 12, 29. Jesus is talking about defeating Satan, and he says the following, How can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? Now, I've read that verse certainly like you have probably a lot of times. And if I just read it, I would say the way that we bind the strong man, again, this is uh, the idea of, uh, you know, how can you get into this house and take the goods? The guy that's really in control has all the power. You got to get him bound before you, uh, you can have the freedom to, to do that. And I would say normally, normally we'd say, and the way that we do that as believers is through prayer. And I think that's, that, that might be primarily the way we do it. But what happened in this city is that you had a, Christians taking a public stand for their faith in Jesus Christ continually, not one time, but continually repenting of their sins, repenting of their sins. We call this a revival. When we say revival, we're praying for, we're not praying for non-believers. We're praying for, you, you got to get vibed before you can be revived, you know. A re believer has never been vibed the first time. Uh, we're talking about Christians uh, uh, taking uh, you know, a, a stand against sin in their own lives and seeking to live a, a holy life before the Lord, a life of, uh, that is different and distinct uh, because of those around them, because of a, a really great set of rules and regulations that we, no, because of a move of God's spirit and because they become more in love with Jesus Christ. Uh, and it just uh, is changed in their lives and it becomes evidence to others. I never thought about binding the strong man in that way. And uh, I think we certainly need to be pray, praying for uh, our church, for our own lives, uh, certainly for, for Oahu and for the Hawaiian Islands and for our country. But uh, I think one of the ways that we do that is, is, is allowing the, the work of God uh, to bring repentance, show, show us our sins. I think there'd be a few businesses across this country if Christians really lived like Christians. I think the, uh, the movie industry would change dramatically. Uh, you know, we could go on. But, uh, you know, there's the Demetrius arguments out there. There's the shouting against the church. But it didn't matter. Uh, these guys had a tremendous impact. These, the, you know, again, the seven churches of Asia Minor that the book of Revelation uh, are written to came from this church. The church at Colossae came from this church. The church at Heriopolis came from this church. Uh, they were having a tremendous, uh, tremendous impact. We could make a case for more and more in the, the most difficult place God did his greatest work. Uh, and that's what makes this, uh, this, these couple of chapters very, very powerful. Again, it's to this church that Paul writes, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Paul stood against the powers of darkness. Uh, he did it spiritually. It wasn't a physical battle. Uh, and we need to remember the same. Secondly, he stayed focused on the truth of the gospel. In order to stop the worship of Diana, he just simply preached the gospel. He didn't attack, he didn't attack the idol. John Stott, the great British theologian, said, because he believed the gospel to be true, he was not afraid to engage the minds of his hearers. He did not simply proclaim his message in a take-it-or-leave-it fashion. 
Instead, he marshaled arguments to support and demonstrate his case. He was seeking to convince in order to convert. I love that. Seeking to convince in order to convince. Uh, our arguments, our apologetics cannot save anyone. <clears throat> Don't save anyone. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ saves people. Uh, but the arguments and the reasons help remove the obstacles. So they'll be open uh, and listen. When we're witnessing to others to stay focused on the gospel in our personal relationship with him. Because you have a testimony. Everybody here has got a story and it's all different. It's all genuine. It's all true. And God's done something and it's, and it's unique. And non-Christians don't have it. Jehovah's Witnesses don't have it. Mormons don't. They don't have it. Uh, Buddhists don't have it. I mean, people can have a religion, but they don't have a personal testimony. They don't have a story about how God changed them. They don't know God personally. They can't talk to him anytime they want. He's not just a breath away to them. He's not there in their darkest hour. They have nothing. But we have all of that. We have, a, we have an awesome story uh, to tell others around us. Paul standing against the powers of darkness, again, had lasting, <coughs> lasting results. The city's gone. The temple's gone. The, uh, the um, local uh, trade guild 666 is gone. Uh, <laughs> but we've got awesome letters that are written to this church uh, and about this church. Warren Wiersbe says, the church ministers by persuasion, not propaganda. We share God's truth, not God's religious lies. Our motive is love, not anger, and the glory of God, not the praise of men. That is why the church goes on, and we must keep it so. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we...
Drive to drive to do the right. 